Hear these words from the priest and prophet, Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty savior for us in the house of his child, David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus, he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him with fear in holiness and righteousness in his presence all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Word of God, word of life. Grace to you and peace. Amen. What a gift it has been over these four weeks to have had the prophet's words delivered to us with a bit of dramatic flair. Our stand in prophets, Gary, Ralph, Bob, and Jean, have delivered the words of promise spoken. By Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezra, and Zechariah so long ago. Long treasured words, but now spoken into a modern world. To hear them announced in this way has been to add the divine voice into the center of our Advent preparations. But for the nine months leading up to today's proclamation, Zechariah has been unable to speak, struck mute ever since the angel delivered the wild news that this aging priest and his childless wife would have a son. Perhaps in an echo of Sarah and Abraham, Luke politely describes Elizabeth and Zechariah as getting on in years. Unsurprisingly, Zechariah questions the angel's prediction, reminding the angel, who may not have heard the narrator's descriptive detail, In case you weren't paying attention, dear angel, I'm an old man. 
And my wife is getting on in years. Apparently, pointing out the obvious to an angel of the Lord is a punishable offense. Or maybe it was forgetting God's history of helping childless old folks get pregnant. And that's what upset the angel. Regardless, Zechariah's response is a show of disbelief, punishable by the silencing of the priest. This is such a curious detail in our story. I wonder how the congregation in Jerusalem felt about their priest going mute. I suppose it's possible they took it as a blessing, especially if they had grown tired of Zechariah's teaching and preaching. Maybe they'd heard all the stories of Zechariah's life before ministry, of the business he used to run and the small mountain town he used to live in. Maybe the congregation appreciated the chance for someone else to get in a word instead of Zechariah just going on and on all of the time. But something miraculous had happened. And the old priest's also old wife was pregnant. And the congregation had something rather spectacular to gossip about in the temple entry and around the bowl of donut holes. All of this, of course, could have been a big distraction for the people of Jerusalem who were living under the occupied forces of a foreign empire and under the rule of a puppet king's government. The announcement of the birth of the one who would turn the people back to God and who would prepare them for the Lord's coming would have generated plenty of excitement amongst the hungry and the poor and the lowly who were to be blessed. And it certainly would have gotten the attention of the rich the proud and the powerful who would have every reason to believe otherwise. Perhaps the angel's act to silence the priest wasn't so much a a punishment as it was preservation. As the world descended deeper into the darkness of foreign rule, And the divide between the powerful and the powerless became more pronounced. God's angels quietly moved about. And God set into motion the mechanisms by which the whole world would get turned upside down. Or maybe right side up as the case may be. We had just nine hours and eight minutes of daylight this past Thursday before the sun slipped below the horizon for the longest night of the year. The winter solstice annual return is a welcome moment celebrated for millennia by almost every culture that has taken note of the movement of celestial bodies, especially our planetary home in relation to the sun's generative warmth and light. For those of us in the Northern Hemisphere who might be feeling oppressed by the light-starved hours in which we continue to complete our daily work, there is relief in knowing the trend has been reversed and we're headed back in the right direction. 
it feels right because we're oriented to the light of day. The day is when we get stuff done. The day is when living things take in the necessary and turn out productive results. The day is when we expect it all to happen. The night, on the other hand, is when things slow down or even stop. The night is for resting and sleeping. The night is when systems go quiet. The night is when we turn it off, shut it down, let it be. And because darkness comes in the night, a shroud covers it all. Night is a mystery. Night threatens what's known, allowing the unknown to come near. And night conceals the truth. And night offers refuge to those who don't want their truths to be known. For these reasons, as night progresses, the darkness grows. And even though we're engineered to dilate our pupils so what remaining light might find its way to the back of our our eyes and signal our brains, what we cannot see holds increasing power over our imaginations. But it's not just our imaginations that confirm the axiom It's always darkest before the dawn. And because there are those who use the darkness to gain advantage, the moments just before dawn can also be the most dangerous. But what does the prophet know? The old priest who becomes a miraculous new father. He's restored in the mercy of new life coming into the world. Elizabeth has delivered a son. Zechariah confirms the angel's prophecy and speaks once again. And this is what he says. Because of the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. This long night is coming to a close. All that God has promised will be fulfilled, and the light that rises in the sky is a sign for all to see. God is coming. A Savior is coming. Forgiveness is coming. Love is coming. Thanks be to God. Amen.